Um, this is the Camera Club of New York's new space, Baxter Street at the Camera Club of New York. And I'm just going to talk really briefly about our organization um, before I turn it over to you guys. So we support emerging photographers and um, we have this, we have a lot of really exciting and dynamic programming coming up. Um, we have a new solo show opening on the 2nd of April with Patricia Vulgaris who was one of our 2014 workspace residents. So she had access to dark rooms and our digital scanning stations and now she'll be having a solo show here um, starting in April. Um, we have conversation series like tonight, we also have classes, and there's a lot of different ways to become involved, a lot of different types of memberships, um, workspace memberships where you can use dark rooms or the digital scanning stations or other support level memberships. So I really encourage you to take a gray folder as you leave. If you would like to learn more, they're back by the door. Um, it gives more information about our organization and different things, different ways of getting involved. And please feel free to come up and ask me any questions. My name is Libby Pratt. I don't think I said that, but um, feel free to ask me any questions. And without further ado, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Lori. Um, great to see you. discussion and presentation with two artists that I know well and love, Marriott Kathy Allen and Zachary Dogger. Um, Marriott is, um, has done three major books, uh, Transformations, some are in the back and are for sale. Yes. Gender Frontier <laughs> and her book Transcuba that came out last year, which she's going to do a presentation about. It and we'll discuss some more. Um, she's you know, had many exhibitions. The next one is going to be during Miami Basel um, in December next year of the work from Transcuba. Um, Zachary Drucker went to SBA. There's a lot of, there was a lot of SBA presence here tonight. Um, and then to CalArts and now lives in LA and works in video and still photography, and more recently has become a, a performer, an actor, consultant, and associate producer of the Emmy award-winning TV series Transparent, which she's also going to talk about tonight. Um, a lot of you probably saw Zachary's collaboration with Reese Ernst last year in the Whitney Biennial, their mutual portraits. And in the last year alone, Zachary's been all over the place with shows and talks, and she's going to show some clips from, uh, she was telling me, a kind of fun talk in Chicago recently. Um, so, Marriott and Zachary, uh, welcome, and uh, we'll start with Marriott. start in the dark. We <laughs> have a few things to say <laughs> and then we can continue with that. Thank you so much Camera Club of New York, Baxter Street. Thank you Alan for dreaming up this conversation um, and I'm delighted that we knew each other about 10 years ago, Zachary and I, and so we're having a little reunion tonight. Um, so I have just a few things I want to say before we start the slideshow. Um, my work with the transgender community, which I have to admit started in 1978. Can you believe? Some people weren't even born, right? <laughs> Actually, most of you weren't. Um, and um, my. One thing I've, I've had as a main focus the entire time that I have worked on transgender variant issues um, has been the defreakification of that, this community, um, which maybe sounds strange to all these young people, but when I started, um, 
it really, I mean, there was no love for the transgender community, I would say. Um, people really did see trans people as dangerous, sick, um, unworthy, close to evil, child molesters. I mean, it was terrible shame and fear. And um, it, it, when I first got involved, I came to realize that I actually had um, a mission, which was to change people's concept about transgender and also for the people themselves who were really shame and guilt. And many people grew up thinking they were insane um, because they didn't know any other people like themselves. So I have done, as, as Alan mentioned, um, two books before TransQ. And the first is called Transformations, Crossdressers, and Those Who Love Them where the focus was on treating transgender people as lovable people who had family relationships and could be seen in the daylight of everyday life. My second book, The Gender Frontier, um, represents the beginning of political activism in the early 90s through approximately 2003. It also represents the coming out of young people youth in schools and elsewhere. And um, and then it goes sort of deeper into portraits and stories. And now with TransCuba, um, it's really, I find that it's the same thing. Um, but I'm working in a somewhat different way. Um, TransCuba is a country I mean, Cuba is, in a, is a country that is in transition itself. And I, my thesis about trans Cuba really what is that transgender people there are, um, represent the country itself. These are people who are in transition. This is a government that is in transition. It's going from a very macho, strict communism to a loosening up more towards socialism and more towards, gradually towards acceptance. What is totally amazing about Cuba is, we, well, the worst things that happened were under Fidel Castro starting the revolution in 1959 where people who were gender variant or different in any way, including even intellectuals and artists, were banished into work camps or sent off on ships. Not desirable. Um, so that was um, a long time during the revolution. Now, in the same Castro family, an amazing thing has happened. And that is Mariela Castro, who is Raul Castro's um, niece, sorry, daughter, Fidel's niece. And Raul is the president now. And she is doing the exact opposite. She is trying to change um, the country in their attitude towards GLBT people. Um, especially trans people. She is doing everything in her power to change the situation, um, which, I mean, can you think of this? The two extremes of between Fidel and Mariella? Isn't that amazing? Anyway, um, it's because of Mariella Castro that I first uh, wanted to go to Cuba. Many, many, you probably know, Walter, about the article that was written about her in the New York Times many years ago, talking about, exactly, about her goals and her work with an organization called Senesex, which is kind of like the GLBT commu uh, Community Center here in New York, um, offering some of the same things. And I read this article and I thought, I really want to meet this woman. She sounds great. And um, 
two years ago, I, uh, she is a sexologist, and she invited a group of uh, other sexologists to go to Cuba for a conference. And the organization is called the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And when I knew that they were going, I'm a member of this organization too, um, I thought I have to go, I have to go with them. <laughs> so I did. And so what I'm going to show you is kind of my story of what happened while I was there and my relationships. And I thought I would just mention at the end that since we are talking about photography um, specifically, um, that the effect of working on Trans Cuba also changed some of the direction of my own photography. And it kind of, it, it um, took me away from doing really um, straight uh, documentary portraiture towards opening up, freeing myself, and um, I guess growing my work to include many things that are, you would call them more clues than actually portraits of people. And I'm just going to show you a small uh, sample of the work. Okay. Um, I guess next. <laughs> Unless you like the type of it. <laughs> so this, oh, I meant, I meant to read a, something of, that Mariella wrote, of the preface to my book, but never mind, I'll read it later. So this, this is one of the things that, um, I can, that Mariella has done that is very much amazing, uh, very amazing. You know, we have Gay Pride Day here, but in Cuba now, we have a week against homophobia and transphobia. And this represents the joy. It says no to discrimination for sexual orientation or for gender identity. And this, every year, they have this week against uh, homophobia and transphobia that takes over a town. It's not, it's a different town every year. And everybody in the town now, if you can imagine, gets involved. There are parades, there are um, all kinds of cultural events, uh, performances, even athletic games. I mean, Mariella participated in the tug of war of the women against the men, which was a huge joke. And, <laughs> and, and so here they are, they're, they are, I would say, joyously running around the block um, as part of a parade. Next, please. So um, this is the cover of my book. And it represents, didn't we skip one here? Uh, no. No, OK, sorry. Um, so, well, then I have to tell you about the Las Vegas Club, um, where it all began for me. As I mentioned, I was at this conference, and one evening, they took us all to this um, uh, place called the Las Vegas Club. The next slide it says Las Vegas Club. Yeah, so they saw, oh, do you want to go there and come back again? Yeah. Okay, this so this is the outside of the Las Vegas Club, mm -hmm. which is, um, I don't know. I loved it from the start. <laughs> okay, now, now let us enter. Sorry about the reverse. <laughs> but, I mean, the decor, it's so beautiful. And by some miracle um, and brilliance, she can speak English. She's completely self-taught. And she became my, my uh, translator uh, for the fir my first two trips. Uh, next, please. So, and this is on a different trip. This is Nomi, again, with her boyfriend, Miguel. In Cuba, I just discovered something astonishing um, about the... I, I should just explain one thing. Um, I only met one um, female to male trans person while I was in Cuba on four trips. And 
Um, I did manage to photograph a lesbian group uh, on my last trip, which, um, but they all say that they are not interested in being men, and, and well, as I said, so this book is all about male to female, and so this is this is no me with Miguel, and no and everybody I met um, who was older uh, of the women, sort of, say 30s or so, they all had teenage boyfriends, teenage to early 20 boyfriends. And even though they were all individuals, they all had the same sexual desires, which I couldn't understand myself. And I kept asking. The only answer I could get was, well, they're so beautiful. <laughs> and so that's it. So Miguel was at the time 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. Next, please. This is Miguel um, getting his very unusual to me haircut, which has become very popular in the meantime. <laughs> what do I know about haircuts? But anyway, <laughs> um, what, I, what I think is meaningful about this particular photograph, I feel like it has almost the history of Cuba all in one picture. I mean, here you have Catholicism. You have, of course, the heroes of the revolution. And you can see it's a very old barber shop. And then you have young, young men in their fancy sneakers, their uh, brand name clothes, Playboy. I don't know, Sexona, I don't know what that part. Anyway, all together in this, in this one flattened out image. Next, please. This is Amanda, who was the first person I met, and I guess I would say has been my most faithful friend from the community. Um, and uh, when I was at uh, Las Vegas Club, I um, saw, I mean, we had, everybody was having a marvelous time singing and dancing, and you, you couldn't believe it. it was such a great evening. And I, it, there were all these beautiful trans women. Amanda is not beautiful, I understand that. But I liked her immediately. I felt she was more accessible, more vulnerable. Um, and I felt, I felt like I wanted to meet her first. So we just became friends. She doesn't speak a word of English. But we, we held hands and walked to the bar. And that was it. This is a man where Amanda lived. I had no difficulty visiting people being taken into their world. So, next please. Um, this is Amanda's sofa. And I was just stunned by, by it, because I don't know if you can see this. Here you have an image of a football player on my right, or is it a baseball player? Who, who wears the blue things underneath it? <laughs> it's the, um, <laughs> one of those violent sports. <laughs> and underneath you have a newspaper with a picture of Marilyn Monroe. And they're both on Amanda's sofa. I saw coming together, it's amazing. Plus the sofa itself, I thought was fascinating. Next, please. And that's Amanda um, also in her, in her little apartment with her Eiffel Tower t-shirt. And there's a lot of, also, it, I noticed very much, there's a lot of toys and playthings and, um, in the apartments that I went to. Anyway, next, please. And this is, my, again, Amanda. And she's on the Malecon, which is um, along the water. It, people, all kinds of people like to meet there and spend their time there. Certain sections invite certain kinds of people. You can see families enjoying the breeze. You can see uh, gay men in the area. You can see trans women. You can see whatever you're looking for in some part of the Malecon. And notice Amanda's shoes. 
uh, the, the, when I was in Cuba on that trip, the Union Jack image was everywhere. <laughs> Very interested in fashion. So everybody had something with the Union Jack designed. So, next, please. So this is Malou, who really has become the, became the main person in my book. Um, she is a um, very powerful, very wonderful person who is essentially, at center sex, is kind of in charge of the trans women. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail about her life, but she's an extremely interesting and uh, intelligent person. Well, I can say one thing. She was thrown out of her house at the age of 15. Her parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are some of those in Cuba. Um, but Malu is somebody who has always figures out what to do. She has amazing street smarts and is now, I mean, she's, um, she has a good position at Santa Sex. Next, please. And she is, she's had chest surgery, uh, breast uh, enhancement surgery and is very pleased with her body. In the meantime, she's also had gender reassignment um, surgery. And um, um, I will probably be doing more nudes of her when we go back in May. Next, please. So this is right after she had her um, breast implants. She's very, very proud. She says she has the most beautiful breasts in Cuba. <laughs> so, in case you're wondering who in Cuba has the nicest <laughs> breasts, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> next please. And this is her at her um, most put together. This says princess here. And uh, she's pretty impressive. Next please. Uh, and this is Malu. We, we went to um, Cienfuegos. This is her fa the house where she grew up. Her father and her mother coming out the door and her young, young sister. She has uh, three brothers. She's the oldest. What's great about this is really that, there was, that I never had any difficulty visiting families, going to, I mean, her, her parents were just fine that I was there, that I was photographing. And um, there was never any sense for me of, that there was resentment or anger or, um, I, I, you know, I was just accepted. Here's an American photographer who likes us and we like her, and that was it. Next, please. Um, by the way, how, how long should I be speaking? I feel like I'm... How long am I? I feel like I'm giving you maybe more detail than you might want. Yes, keep going. Okay. So this is Natalie and a photograph of her um, both ways. And Natalie is one of the great tragedies of my experience in Cuba. Um, she's, she's 22 in this picture. She's HIV positive because a boyfriend of hers didn't tell her. Um, and she doesn't know if he infected her on purpose or not. She has been, most of the people I should say, I'm, just, I'm omitting something really important. Um, the, the women cannot change their birth names. And they're not allowed to take most jobs. So many of them are prostitutes, have to work in, in prostitution. And of course, most don't really want to, but they do. And Natalie was tired of that, didn't want to do it, tried to get a job as a seamstress in a clothing factory. And she, they wouldn't hire her because of her appearance. And um, so at a certain point in desperation, she started working with somebody who was injecting silicone in hips um, to, create, to create, create hips, feminine mm -hmm. curves. 
And she, with her first client by herself was an American trans woman who then died. And Natalie is now in jail for life in the men's jail. Okay. Next, please. This is another, another, I met her first when she was 17, she's 18 in this picture. This is another, another uh, woman who's HIV positive, again from a boyfriend. Next. And here she is with her mother, who has been extremely supportive and helpful and trying to get her through being sick from HIV. And her mother is one of the, my favorite people that I met. It, um, and I have her a quote, uh, quote from her. She said, um, well, uh, father is not supportive. And so she said to her husband, you know, what's the matter? In five years, all men will be having sex with other men. <laughs> the, uh, next, please. <laughs> I uh, went to the beach a couple of times, and I, I, I learned the difference between capitalism and communism when I went to the beach. I, um, I paid to get a deck chair and thought, this is my, de this is my deck chair, I'm going to sit on it. Well, <laughs> forget it. Everybody sat on my deck chair. <laughs> I hardly had any space. So I thought, okay, I can't sit on that deck chair. So then I, um, I got, I bought some food, and what do you think happened? <laughs> <laughs> then, the, to top it all off, I decided to go out into the waves, and they had these nice um, rafts, big rafts. So I got myself a raft. I thought, and I thought I would get to pick who went on the raft with me, but no. Everybody jumped onto the raft. And I was trying. Anyway, so then I, so for a while there, I was furious inside. I wasn't yelling or screaming, but I was in a rage. I said, I hate it here to be And then I suddenly, then it suddenly dawned on me, wait a moment. It's not bad manners. It's, this is, com they were raised under communism. You share. You know, you don't have private ownership. What was I thinking? And then I got over it. I said, really? It's a cultural thing. Um, next, please. Okay. This, her name is Wendy, and she's intersex. But her parents raised her as a, as a guy, and she had to go through working in the fields, the military, everything. And um, finally, in Cuba, because of Mariela Castro, you can have surgery, gender-confirming surgery. Once a year, some Belgian doctors come to Cuba and do it, and there's a long waiting list. So Wendy um, uh, had it and, um, and almost died. She was out of it for three days, three days and three nights, and then she came back out of it. I thought, what is this? Uh, Catholicism is re-emerging. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's Wendy. Okay. It's a real piglet. This is not a stuffed animal. I don't know if you could tell from back there. Um, this is one of my actual favorite. Okay, this is one of the few women that is able to support herself. Um, she's a painter and a sculptor, and her work is very popular. Tourists like it, and she, her work gets exhibited. And she went to, managed to go to art school, although she was only allowed to go at night because of being trans. They didn't want her around. But she managed to go to night school and get a, an art education. And um, um, she's um, this is she's this is a drawing that she's just beginning a painting. She does a lot with houses and architecture in Havana, 
as well as um, uh, Madonnas, a new black Madonnas with white babies, a lot of it is, and very interesting work. And I'm uh, just finishing. Okay. Just because uh, yeah, I, no, I hate to do this and be rude, but I really want to get oh, yeah. to the end where everybody gets to ask questions. Well, I'm about, I'm, I, I am just there. Okay. One more picture, and then, and then we've done it. Oh, perfect. This is the grand finale. Okay. <laughs> we end with love. What I like about this picture is that I didn't realize when I took it. There's a woman coming towards her on the left, men coming towards her on the right. And in the middle is love. <laughs> and that's it. for sharing your work and when Ellen asked if I would be in New York and available to do this um, and brought Marriott into the conversation I was thrilled because I've been such a fan of your work and your work has been so inspiring to me um, the gender frontier came out and was published when I was a student at SBA and I think was uh, an early sort of marker for me in understanding what was possible um, and then in seeing your new work, I think it's amazing to kind of, um, so much of our discourse around transness is um, really centered around, you know, the U.S., right, or the, or the Western world. And we kind of neglect to acknowledge the full scope of the international kind of, um, tr you know, trans community. Um, and... I think um, of you as really a pioneer in kind of representing the trans community and you know, adopting the trans community and being willing to kind of um, to represent us with authenticity and truth and honesty. And I just wanted to start by thanking would you. you. Would you, would you. <laughs> And yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, Marriott and I met probably shortly after Gender Frontier came out, and um, I had I wasn't familiar with transformations at the time, but I remember I was at your house, and you showed me a copy of Transformations, and you said something along the lines of, "I know that." this book will be in good company with you. Or I'll, I know that you'll give this book a good home. And I, that stuck with me, and I've always um, really coveted my copy of Transformations, because I think it's such a remarkable document of... It came out in the late 80s, right? Yeah, 89, 90. The late yeah. 80s. Yeah. Um, so Alan mentioned that I've worked sort of on this TV show and was... Um, influential in sort of creating a character arc for the protagonist and we which if you haven't said it's on amazon yeah and there are 10 half hour episodes and they're developing the next uh, season and it's just extraordinary yeah. and there was a lot of questions about how this character arrived at a late transition at seven it's about you know a, a patriarch who transitions at 70 and you know, her three grown children, extended community, etc., kind of responding and living their own messy, complicated lives. Um, when it came to creating a backstory for this person, like, you know, and answering the question, how did this person arrive at 70 years old um, to a trans identity, um, transformation was brought into the writer's room as sort of, um, a really cogent and important link and what did this person's um, background look like you know so you know cross-dressers are a distinct and you know autonomous especially within the history of um, the trans movement 
Transvestia, which was this publication by Virginia Prince, they always really set themselves apart um, from the LGBT community. Anyways, this is all exposition, yeah. but um, yeah, transformations. And there's this episode that takes place in a cross-dressing retreat, and it's literally like yeah, Marianne's so book kind of coming right off the page. And on <laughs> so, I recognize Yeah, that. so we... <laughs> Yeah, we had the production designer buy a coffee, we had the costume department buy a coffee, we had the hair and makeup people buy a coffee, and your influence... Well, it should be sold up by now. Yeah! <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I thought I could talk a little bit about my kind of uh, trajectory as an art maker and cultural producer. Um, and I'm going to take you guys through, that's the wrong one, sorry. I have a few projects, I have a few videos, I don't know what you all are familiar with, and I don't want to bore you, because, um, I'm just going to go to the back for this. I think boredom is... <laughs> I often cite this early project of mine as an adolescent as being my first art project. My mother had a, a chest of dress-up clothes in the basement. I would kind of uh, dive into it and emerge from the basement as these different feminine selves. And they had this photo album of all of these um, female alter egos. And they were Polaroids that my parents took. Uh, I held on to a lot of them, and I think in a lot of ways it kind of encapsulates my approach to image making and exploring a self outside of physical reality. Um, I kind of revisited this site um, with a friend, Amos Mack. This is where I went to high school, um, features, as it were, um, as well as my childhood home. Um, I work collaboratively often, um, or almost always, actually. And this collaboration was very much a sort of interchange, uh, an interaction. Um, it was made in 2010, the end of 2000, maybe 2009 even. Um, my background is as a photographer, and I've just steadily kind of increased or expanded my scope of media. Um, from this project, I kind of altered one of the images to create a welcome mat in my basement, <laughs> which was like, uh, at first it was sort of <laughs> just a branding exercise. <laughs> <laughs> a way to sell something for $50 out of the show. Um, the idea came to me in the shower. <laughs> um, it was really, I mean, the primary kind of um, inspiration was describing a cultural position that I felt I was potentially in. Um, yeah. So that's the welcome mount. I'm gonna skip these. Uh, when I was at CalArts, I started working in performance and video, experimental film, installation, and kind of shelved photography for a little while. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I wasn't showing it as my work as an artist. I was doing all these other things. Um, all the while, I was photographing my relationship in a kind of diaristic mode. It wasn't ever intended for public consumption. Um, it was really just a personal document in the way that we, you know, take snapshots of ourselves and each other. Um, and it was in this sort of diaristic mode that we 
Reese and I created this incredible archive of images. After five years, we kind of realized that it was a body of work. And in the process of just living our lives together and photographing each other, we had amassed an artwork, an epic artwork. Um, there was a few thousand images. Um, they really kind of span, they span six years, right? And sort of some of the earliest images are grainy digital, you know, early digital photography or like film, House of Blood um, images. And then I kind of moved into using a digital Leica snapshot deluxe camera. I don't know. Well, I think I think this is a photo centric <laughs> crowd I'm talking to. So we can I can talk cameras. Usually <laughs> wouldn't. <laughs> And it was interesting, actually, how this sort of came to be a public <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> Fun breakfast. Lunch. <laughs> I had a studio visit with Stuart Homer, who was uh, curating the 2014 Biennial, and it was actually kind of an afterthought. You know, I put together some of these images in a folder, and really actually at no point in making this project did I think it would become a public <laughs> document. I kind of just thought this is what I'm doing with my life, and this is sort of what happens, you know, behind closed doors or something. because of, I guess, the sort of public self or public persona I've been steadily kind of building. And I don't use social media very much. None of these images really appeared on social media either. Um, and it was, it was honestly like a really big decision to reveal. But um, we were thrilled that it was received as well as it was. Um, and yeah. Recently our collaborators were no longer in a relationship. Um, and these kind of late later images sort of represent the end of the relationship or a time when there was sort of a lot of distance and space. Which, of course, we also didn't know that we were documenting. And Ruth is also an associate producer of Transparent and appears in it, right? Yeah, we, we continue to work uh, together. And his medium is film mostly, right? Is yeah. a filmmaker, yeah. And, you know, over these years we were together, I mean, it was a really productive year, you know, several years for both of us. Just, um, we made five films together, um, two of which are still in process, in progress, even though they were shot a long time ago. Um, This is the installation view at the Whitney. This is a poster. I mean, I like creating something that people can take home with them. This is in Toronto. So after the workshop here, it went to the Art Gallery of Ontario and this Patterson One Stop. I guess it's, you know, the digital displays in the subway system. Um, commission art 
projects, right? Like they show artwork. This is the difference between Canada and the US. <laughs> um, so I loved the person who kind of curated and organized this sent me these installation views, which I think are hilarious um, for obvious reasons. Um, and this last project, I'm just going to flip through it really quickly. I don't know. I feel like it's maybe a lesser known project, so I thought maybe it'd be interesting for you guys to see, but um, Luke Guilford is a friend of mine who's uh, an editorial photographer and a director. Um, we became friends in 2008, and he sort of started photographing me. Um, this is for a Margiela ad, actually. Um, for their 20th anniversary um, editorial. It's my mother. I work with my mom a lot. Um, my aunt. <laughs> and he sort of documented my uh, gender transition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my transition into something else entirely. So we, after like, We've created this whole body of work, kind of, also, you know, in this sort of voyeuristic mode of, you know, a friend watching me transition. Um, we got together, and we had this opportunity to create a new series of works, and we thought, well, how do we, like, what could we build onto that, just to, like, totally throw it in a different direction, instead of this kind of, like, really predictable, you know, prototype of like the trans narrative. Um, so we created this kind of less predictable continuum of um, evolution. <laughs> and it was, it was published with a text piece that I'd written kind of explaining what this performance meant to me or what it meant to be kind of covered, you know, after sort of being, um, so revealed. So that's that. I'm gonna show you guys two quick videos too. Um, can we speed through that too quick? Because I can go through it again in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the alternative. <laughs> Uh, so, I, I really wanted to show you guys, this is totally new. Well, do it. I have two pieces, right? I've been, I've always wanted to be a talk show host, which is kind of like a really goofy joke most of the time, but it's also half true. And took her out the bag. Scoop the conquer. Walk a stick to get ahead. And if it doesn't make you nervous, ain't worth doing. <laughs> so that is the flow with Sabrina on your leather. Um and this was this is a new piece. So this is the skew. And it's with four women that I think are just incredible, like four of my favorite people. Um, Vianne Barnes, who I've worked with a lot, she's my chosen sister. Uh, Precious Davis, who is a, an activist and a community advocate, that's Precious. Jen Richards, who's sort of a, a cultural commentator, writer. She started the Trans 100, as well as uh, writes a blog called We Happy Trans. And Angelica Ross, who's uh, started Trans Tech, which is a company. She's like the CEO of a company. She's the boss, basically. <laughs> um, and we did this piece just a few weeks ago at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And you know, the You'll Love It, which was in New York, is very much about kind of spotlighting these different um, archetypes and thinkers and interesting people. And this is very much a conversation about the state of, uh, you know, trans people. 
Lucky with my house. And it, you got lucky with my no, house. No, but I think when you stop looking, it comes to you. Let me say something. I have been single. Don't do, don't do it. I have been single. Only people do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't We're do shopping it. Don't in the store, honey. I have been single for eight years. I have been not looking. I have been looking, I have been playing. Do you go on dates? I have been playing peekaboo. <laughs> Every yeah, she, what, what the deal is is that she can't Looking for love in all the wrong places. No, let, well, yeah, I may be, because Craigslist I know ain't the right place. <laughs> <laughs> but let me tell you, I am starting to get some luck from you. I'm on Grinder now, Jack. Yes, girl. <laughs> yes, yes bitch. I, I, yes, I, yeah, there's straight boys on Grinder. Oh, that's not straight. Huh? But they have tribes. <laughs> but they have tribes on Grindr. What are they? are straight boys. No, there are there are straight guys on there that are looking for trans girls. But my 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 surprise is that Jen tells me that I'm more so attracted to gay men, and I think gay men type. Gay men type. Yes, because because why is it the gay men? They look cleaner. They smell cleaner. <laughs> they're dressed cleaner. Like straight but men. Don't more, do more. We just have culturally more in common. What's that? Like, I think we culturally have a lot more in common. With I mean, like men. I'm a, a well-dressed man with sharp shoes and just, uh, like if he's straight, he's using a douchebag. Like he's using and has that hygiene. Yeah. Exactly. Hygiene is like number one. But I mean, I just I'm sitting on the train because you know I, I'm a brown line girl, so I'm riding the brown line and I just notice all these men. When I get up, you know, because the earlier this is a tip though, I will tell you this. <laughs> The earlier you get up, the early bird gets the worm, honey. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you get on that train and they're dressed for work, they're dressed for the office. And but the deal is, is that the ones that are really, really nice dressed, I think they're gay. And I'm, you know what? I'm like, you know what? I don't overlook that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but what, what gay man is gonna look at you? But we have had this discussion Not before. Yeah. That's, yeah. We have had this discussion yeah. before. There are a lot of gay men who adore and worship trans women. I don't want them to adore me like, oh, you know, like, oh, you look fabulous, you look cute. I need them to be some action about that too. <laughs> but there's also a place where I feel like I want my fiance to treat me like a goddess. I'm the queen and he's the king. Like, and adore me, honey. They take me to lunch all the time. Shopping. <laughs> and I go home and I screw my husband. No, but I think, but I think currently, like, I see, like, a lot of trans women who have a troop of gays around them who worship them and give them life. And I think that's what I don't that's that. that. But, yeah. that's a, but that's a kind of relationship I think in queerness. I, I got Twitter and Facebook for that. I don't mean that. I don't think it makes it look straight. Well, you know, there was a point that you hit on, Angelica, earlier about younger guys, right? And I think that there's a key seed of truth I'm there, there age, which is that. The younger generation might have much more fluidity than we do. I mean, we are really kind of like indoctrinated into these binary ways of thinking, whether it's male, female, I'm gay, I'm gay. Peg. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the young boys are a lot older. There's younger, I mean, I see it in the clubs all the time. I see, you know, younger guys sort of like. It's like a guy messaged me, he was 18. That's young. Charming. I never thought, listen, this is, I never thought I would marry a trans man, and now I'm marrying a trans man, but we are king and queen. You Let know, me be right? clear. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> you left that forever, right? <laughs>
love the different permutations of sexuality that are portrayed on the show, that it's not black and white. There is a fluidity of gender, of sexuality. It allows the storytelling to be first and foremost, because it allows there to be characters that have multidimensionality to them. Everybody has their own ideas of what it means to be alive and be sexual and explore and experience. And yeah, I just like trying to show everything as real as I possibly can. I really want people to watch it and feel like the show is about them. I think that sort of similar to the gay and lesbian community 15, 20 years ago, there was a veil up, and I think it made people feel that there was an us and them quality, and I think that that is a veil that Transparent is trying to lift. I think the world is changing exponentially, fast, and I'm honored to be part of that. Are you sure I can't do the eyebrows? I'm positive. Is that just... No, please. <laughs> How many of them are you going to take? Tammy's coming over tonight. I just want to see how hot I look. Your husbands are weird. Anyways, <laughs> are our transgender consultants. They are here for us to ask questions of, to offer input. They're a part of our creative team. They have been there to make sure that we have a context for this story and that we speak eloquently on these topics that are really important. They are our go-to people to make sure that we are staying on the path of telling this very true, realistic, non-caricature. Transgender people are most often represented as villains or victims. Then the programming itself continues that cycle because no one else is learning anything new. This show takes it to the next level in creating an authentic representation. I'm sorry about the more and the mora and the he and the she. I'm just a person, and you're just a person, and here we are. And baby, you need to you need to get in this whirlpool, or you need to get out of it. People are scared of things that they don't understand, and hopefully this show can change that. So if there's anything to be gotten from the show. It's that we're here, our lives are worth living, and we exist in a way that is filled with joy and hope. Because all of these characters in some way live on a foundation of hope. to get the start and then I really want your participation um, because I, I know there are a lot of um, people working with similar subjects and who have a lot of input and would love to you know, participate in this dialogue. So um, I think I'll start with, so you know, that series is just so amazing, and you know the the nuances, the complexity, the the number of characters who are so fully portrayed is just um, amazing. It's a real achievement, and it's so great that it also was award winning in its first season, and, and therefore just attracted so much more attention. With with the explosion of interest and uh, exposure to trans subjects, personalities, artists, um, and with people's better understanding and greater familiarity. Um, my question is, how has that opened uh, the subjects that you work with? How is that, you know, and what I'm saying is that I think there was a point at which there is a certain education that you feel responsible to in the work and portrayals and you know also wanting to be sure that you're avoiding the pejorative tropes that are from the past and now that there's so much more familiarity what is that allowing you to do or what will that allow you to do wow. <laughs> Well, one thing is that, that we're so moving so quickly from 
the binary um, <clears throat> attitude in the past, you know, men over here, women over there, that, and there's much more of fluidity, gender queer, gender fluid, and questioning and all the rest, and that provides, a, well, first of all, I consider that all very liberating to begin with. But secondly, it, I think it offers so many more creative opportunities. And, you know, you're not stuck in, in your portrayal, as, as is obvious. Although you do present in a very um, femme, <laughs> traditional femme manner, but, um, but except for when you're playing with Reese and, and later, and become uh, animalistic. <laughs> <laughs> term. <laughs> but I do think I think that this this gradual like greater acceptance does open up the, um, the possibilities in photography, in depiction, in um, and it's you know it used to be that I remember it sort of in the eighties and nineties when somebody would um, say would dress as a woman but then would wear a mustache and people were deeply offended. They would say this is this is gender fuck, this is terrible, this is, you know, insulting, especially the cross dressers. It's insulting. And now some variation like that, people would say, yeah, this is this is making a statement that we are really all a mixture. And Really you touched on that at the beginning yeah. about saying how, um, you know, just uh, somebody coming from the documentary portrait tradition that you, that working in Cuba had allowed you to um, throw in, you know, something other than documentary in yeah. the equation. But, and I think what you're talking about specific to trans Cuba was more about looking at the place and the location and showing more context than portraiture, yes. but, but also I'm thinking, you know, like I know that over the years you've done fantasy yeah. sort of uh, sessions with some of the people that you know well, just giving them the chance to uh, be theatrical and mm -hmm. to embody an aesthetic that's not in your published aesthetic. Right. Um, do you see yourself? Like throwing in a mix like that in the future. Not, I mean, I'm not sure what. In the same way that we're talking about gender fluidity, yeah. maybe that will open up the kind of aesthetic fluidity. Well, that's a great, that's a great way of thinking about it. And I, in a way, I, I, I feel a certain kind of freedom in depicting um, people that I did not feel so much before and. I just came from a conference um, and did some playing with some uh, very young people who did not identify at all. They just they just were. And I think that what you're saying is it is going to become more and more appropriate. And I mean, it, it relates so much also to to what you're doing. You you have a feeling of freedom. That I mean, I could never, I could never have. I felt like I was doing two separate things. There were the drag artists on one side, and then there were the, you know, the serious, <laughs> I had to put it that way, cross dressers, transsexuals, and you do not mess with them. Whereas with the drag artist, you could do, you could just get out there and play. And I think the playing, the, the not taking things so heavily, so PC, I guess, is um, it's really going to be more fun, in a way, more open, more... Zachary and I were having this conversation earlier today, we were talking about your book, Transformations in the 80s, and I was talking about, you know, your sense of obligation to be de very deferential to the subject, just to be sure that, you know, you were creating uh, an empathetic and flattering portrayal of the subject. Well, flattering maybe is not the fair word, but you know, something. And you know, and by the end of it, you felt a certain constraint as an artist. You know, like that's, yeah. you're kind of wearing a, 
um, straight jacket. Mm -hmm. And but Zachary said something really interesting about that, which for her looking at that body of work, it, it was even more subversive that they were so in the realm of um, traditionally portrayed and see that that in itself was such a subversive thing to do in that period that, you know, I was like, it just totally changed the way How I looked at that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, especially because you know photographers had never really demonstrated that sensitivity or um, consideration towards their yeah. subjects. I mean, it, I think it's a completely yeah. new approach. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Well, one of the things was that I was dealing with people who had been so hurt and maligned and so had such bad feelings about themselves internally that that's why I was particularly careful not to do, inflict any more pain. But it, at times it did limit me. I mean, I remember once, this is such a minor thing, but it still, it always stuck with me. Um, somebody said to me, you know, those were terrible pictures of me. I said, oh really, why? She said, well, I wasn't smiling. And I thought, oh, oh my goodness. If you understand what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, one thing that I really appreciate about uh, Transparent and the way the characters are conceived, and especially that protagonist, the patriarch who is transitioning, is that, um, you know, obviously creating that show and having you and Reese on the set and advising, there's this effort to be sensitive and to understand the issues. But what I love about it is that in understanding the issues, you can still allow that protagonist to have character flaws that recur. And that this is a parent who has fucked up sometimes, like mm -hmm. most parents, and has to pay the consequence down the road in spite of the fact that everyone's trying to be on board with the transition, you know, and, and that, allowing that complexity, um, I think, with all of the characters, is, yeah. creates, you know, this, what do you call a comic drama that is, is really uh, complex and, and but, you know, maybe in terms of how the success of the, being very specific about how that opens up possibilities is what about the success of the first season and how that would allow something else or further in the second season? Do you have any sense of that? <laughs> Can you even speak about the second season? I can't, no. Um, but I can speak to this sort of truncated momentum that I think the trans community has experienced as subjects, you know, and having this sort of malignment, this sort, you know, these representations of serial killers or, you know, yeah. Science of the Lambs and Sleepaway Camp and, uh, yeah. Yeah, what's another one? Psycho. Yeah. Um, you know, we're really coming out of the dark ages and I also liken gender to a black and white television set from the 1950s, which is the prototype that we're still, for whatever reason, uh, mimicking, right? Despite the fact that we're full color, HD, 3D, about to be virtual reality, we're all humans, right? And our genders are not that clearly defined. I think that it's always up to the younger generation to redefine kind of what those borders and boundaries are. Um, and I, you know, made really conscious decisions not to disappear, like decades of trans people have, you know, and in another time I'd be speaking in a higher Minnie Mouse octave, and my name would be Betty, and I would be dental hygienist or something, right? But, you know, I come from a feminist parentage, uh, parents who told me that I could be whoever I wanted to be, and that I didn't have to pander 
to a world that didn't really have a place for me. Um, and I think that it comes out of those sort of more progressive styles of kind of treating each other and treating your kids and treating young people um, that will really kind of uh, move our momentum, really like move us forward. Yeah. One of the things I particularly appreciate about Transparent is that the protagonist is not the only person that we have to wonder about, that we have that we watch the exploration. Everybody else there has a story. And the fact that you don't single him out. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's the person with the problems. Here's the person who's having this big dramatic change. I just so appreciate it that he's one of a spectrum of people, all of whom have equal stories, have equally complicated. It's the, I mean, it's the yeah. first time we've seen a trans person situated in a, fam in, a, in a family. I mean, it's the first time a trans person hasn't been either on a pedestal or um, yeah. in a gutter. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. A pedestal and, and, I, and then I think, yeah. you know, for me looking at it, and looking at it while I was visiting family, you know, it's it's about family and it's about the terror and, and terrible consequences of the, the codependence that is rampant in families and what how everybody damages everybody else and hurts. You know, it feels very casually to just you know commit terrible deeds to one's siblings or parents or vice versa and. All of that swirling around that's so universal, so that it's it's um, more than any any single character's arc. It's it's about this whirlwind of codependency in the family. You know, I feel pretty hopeful and optimistic about the future of trans representation in the media and in pop culture, um, but I think that. We should also be careful not to kind of um, think that it's in the bag, you know. And that's right. something I always try to like remind myself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I have read a few scripts for pilots that are coming out within the next year, and you know there is an interest and a curiosity about trans people and trans stories, and clearly the world is ready for it. Um, I think the sort of recognition that trans public figures have gotten in the past years and indicated that people want to know, and maybe you don't know a trans person in your real life, but the closest thing you can get to it is a public figure. I think it's like a really, um, these representations that are coming out, I think, they're trying to place trans characters without any kind of context or understanding of what those stories might be like. And there hasn't really been the same kind of effort to um, include trans people in authoring those representations. Um, so I think that we're going to see a wave of trans representation, but I'm not, you know, I think that's still something to kind of be cautious or wary of. And you know what I mean? And not to go too far into that kind of combative or you know, because I think it's a it's a delicate time. I mean, I think yeah, um, that it's the very beginning. Yeah. But I also think we've yet to see a backlash as well. I think we yeah. are yeah, about to be experiencing a backlash if you consider that that there are some states where they're trying trying to remove the uh, ban on discrimination in, in GLBT people. Mm -hmm. It's happening. There is there we are. You know, we're making two steps forward, possibly one step back. And and then we also have to realize that the United States is not a, just an island. I mean, there is the rest of the world, which uh, most of trans people are in dire, dire circumstances. And we tend to think it's all going well. Well, it is. It's all, it's going well, mostly. But, you know, I, I dread to think what's going to be happening with these political figures that are coming into power. So, um, how about from the audience? Oh yes, there's an audience. Right, <laughs> <one, two. laughs> artists and thinkers. 
or you know, and Marianne and Zachary, you should feel free to ask the audience something. <laughs> <laughs> How are you all? <laughs> uh, let me let me ask this, Zachary. Zachary also spoke at NYU today. Oh, oh. double whammy. <laughs> very large sociology lecture class. Only two people in the room had seen Transparent. And, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that a lot of people here have seen it or know a lot about it. How many of you have seen it? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, we're not in my ear. No. <laughs> <laughs> I told you to get there on touch. <laughs> yeah, Zachary also told me that one of the things that Professor brought up with uh, the question was, um, why is this happening now? What what's led to this moment? But in a way, I, I sort of feel like a lot of I don't know a lot of people here know about that history, and you mentioned yeah. it a bit. Well, I would like to ask a question. So what, um, what's usually on my mind is, is sex, like I come to this world from a sexual point of view and what I really like always about Transparent and about Marriott's work and your work and, is that, that the, um, the sexual imagery, the naked body, in Transparent, everybody's got a sex story, so sex is definitely a part of it and um, I just wonder how do you feel about the people who are kind of, kind of like in the trans movement now? We don't, you know, it's like the place of, say, people who did she male pornography. Where, you know, how, where is their place, or how do you feel about them and what they contributed to the movement the way it is today? Mm. Yeah, it is a good question. This is Veronica Vera, by the way who is a <laughs> school for boys who want to be girls. And I am honored to be the dean of photography at her school. I am honored to have you. Oh, yes. But anyway, just everybody should know of Veronica. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Put it on podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, let's talk about sex, because it was yeah. fun like seeing that clip from Chicago where they're yeah. getting down to dating. And Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think people are are more comfortable, especially what's really interesting to me is people are more comfortable having a mixed body. I mean, it used to be again. I have to go back to history um, that nobody wanted to show or even talk about the fact that maybe they were. They had a mixed body. They hadn't. It, so, if they'd had full surgery, I'm talking about um, gender uh, reassignment surgery, you know, work on the whole body, then yes, it was okay to show the body. Um, but not if, if you know, there were um, both masculine and feminine. Um, body parts. And this was considered just awful somehow to talk about or to show. And even when I first began, even people didn't want to be seen when they were sort of halfway through getting dressed. It had to be all dressed completely or as women or not dressed at all as men. And now, I mean, it was really rigid in that respect. But now I think people are much more comfortable with having um, mixed gender. And I think that's going to happen more and more. And with, um, you know, with, with now, it used to be that in order to, um, say, change your name, your birth name, or get a passport or whatever, you had to have full, full reassignment surgery. That's no longer yeah, the case. Who what? sued the city? Patricia, who sued the, oh. who sued the city? She's back there. Oh. I didn't do any Patricia, of the work. Patricia, do the <laughs> I, I was just a plaintiff. I didn't do the work. Lawyers did the work. <laughs> but what, Patricia, would you mind just explaining for a moment? Um, well, I don't know how many people are familiar with um, New York City. Just um, the board. New York City. New York City East has its own um, Bureau of Vital Health and they issue their own birth certificates. So. Um, 
they recently just finally changed their policy so that you can get your uh, gender marker changed without having proof of what they used to ask for, which was called convertive surgery and psychological evaluation. So now they've liberalized that policy. And um, New York State had done it um, last spring, last summer, I mean. So New York State now is in, because New York City and New York State were separate. And actually, New York City was trailing New York State. And California's done it. So there's a few states now that are making it much more, uh, much more um, liberal and accommodating policy for people to actually get their documents in order. But there's still uh, an awful lot of states in this country that, that just have really draconian rules about things like that. Uh, I think going back to for Veronica's uh, question about you know like the role of sexuality, and I'm also reminded of Marriott's comment that you know, many of her subjects in Cuba were sex workers because of lack you know lack of any other option, right? Yeah. It was. I mean, employment was, yeah. Right, survival sex or sex <laughs> work or, you know, whatever you want to call it. I think um, that for, you know, a hundred years in the US or however many years, you know, trans people have either assimilated entirely and disappeared into, you know, cis normative culture or have hidden, you know, at night or kind of yeah. behind closed doors and you know even for trans women that I know they're 10 years older than me um, who maybe came out 10 years before I did you know they too were sort of faced with an, impos an impossible employment situation mm -hmm. that would necessitate sex work um, and then it sort of um, turns into uh, I don't know uh, I mean, it's hard to get out of once you're yeah. in it, right? And yeah. I see this with so many of my sisters. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I, I really try to take accountability for, you know, the privilege I've had as a white person, as a person coming from a uh, supportive family, having, you know, class privilege. Like, all of those things sort of got me through college, got me to college, got me through college, got me to graduate school, got me in the door so I can have kind of a career and a professionalized life, but that's exceptional. It doesn't happen, typically. Um, you know, I downplay the obstacles that I faced m m most of the time as a trans person in order to kind of I think put a good face on it and to say like you know I'm, I'm a role model on this you know you can um, do it too yeah. right and I think that that sort of um, whether it's realistic or not I mean you know trans women of color are, are being I mean there's a, basically a genocide happening yeah. um, which is also kind of, you know, would be negligent and irresponsible to like leave out of the conversation yeah. when talking about representation, the people who are not being represented. Yeah. Um, so that's my yeah. kind of role as an, as an activist as well yeah. in like a kind of pop cultural <laughs> context. Um, I think that you know, we never see trans people in service positions, right? Because there's always been this sort of perception that a trans person working at Starbucks will scare away customers, you know, or that. Mm. Um, so employment discrimination is really the most damaging kind of component to our lack of visibility in the world, mm. right? Yeah, it's true. I mean, I remember seeing a trans woman working at Sephora uh, a while back, and so I went back to the same Sephora to see if she was still working there. She wasn't. Now, there could be any number of reasons for that, but I was really intrigued when I saw her. But I said we should also mention not only are trans people, primarily trans women, being murdered right and left, I mean, very high number, but also the suicide rate for trans people is something like people who attempted suicide or and or succeeded is about 40% as compared to the 
average person is something like, what, 2 or 5 percent? Very, very low. But if you could imagine how painful it is for so many people. I mean, we, here we are making art out of, out of it and, and really... One of the things that I really appreciated being in Cuba was that I spent my time with people that I'm the equivalent of which in the United States I have not spent time with. Does that make sense? Um, so, so I, and and I um, saw such a difference also from. I mean, I don't know the basically street workers in the United States, but I know a lot about them. Whereas in Cuba, those were the, those were my friends. Those are my friends. Those are the people I spent time with, and I was so impressed by the um, the lack of resentment, the resilience, the beauty, the the good time that I was able to have. And I feel like the and and they don't get murdered. I mean it's and and there are almost no issues of alcoholism or drugs. Whereas here I, I think we we tend to associate um, street workers with um, drugs and alcohol and and rage, um, and so that that was an eye-opening experience too. Um, so what was I talking about? <laughs> 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 on and on about, about about suffering. That's what I was talking about. Yeah. Yes, Christian. Um, and, uh, um, when you got to meet these individuals, what was their original impression? Maybe was like. Um, I don't know, Western world or capitalistic based world um, compared to like socialism about how the trans community over there was treated? Did they see it as like, oh, life must be better, you know, across, you know, the ocean? Or did they feel that like this is just, I mean, thing, or were they maybe like, I don't know, um, I, I, like, they <clears throat> sort of, I don't know, went by the sort of socialist line that this is, you know, socialist paradise, that kind of ideal. They do not think it's paradise. Uh -huh. They resent not being able to t change them before they finish the equivalent of high school. Many are thrown out of their homes still. Um, I think they guess, without necessarily knowing, but they guess that it's much better here. But there are some things they don't, I mean, when I, back to sex, and I, and my uh, trying to figure out why they all had the same sexual preferences of wanting these young boys, basically. Um, and I said, you know, in the United States, people have relationships, you know, you know, I went on and on about the range of kinds of relationships. They were completely stupefied, they didn't understand it at all. What? You know, if I have a relationship with a woman, then I'm a lesbian. Why? Why would I want that? You know. Why? Do, you know. And a lot of the things that we always used to hear um, in the past. Well, if I'm going to go through this amount of trouble, well, of course I want to be with a man. You know. And I want. And they refer to these young guys as their husbands. It's very. It's. It's very uniform. So I think, I mean, if they were sitting here listening to Zachary or um, other people here, they would be in a state of shock because that part, that the sexual aspect is, I guess it's very traditional, is what I would say. They'd be, uh... They might be quite happy because there are a lot of potential young husbands in the room. <laughs> uh, well, that's... <laughs> well... <laughs> I Shall I take some of you back to Cuba when I go to the house? Yes, um, This is a question for Zachary. I'm curious about the body of work that you made with your partner. And um, when you talked about how you had sort of hesitated to share that, I was curious 
what what was your hesitation? Um, how much of it had to do with the story of transitioning, and how much of the work itself is actually about transitioning? How much of it is just about intimacy, and just like this is just a relationship? I think you know more the latter for me. But I mean, we're at this really peculiar time in mm. in trans politics where it is topical and it's the thing that people are interested in. Um, so it moves to the forefront of any conversation, despite the fact that there's all these other currents running through it. I mean, everything is contextual, right? Like, the conversation we're having right now is, well, it could only happen right now, right? It's not gonna happen in five or 10 years. It's gonna be such a different conversation at that point. Um, the, yeah, I don't, it, the trends, the, you know, capturing, this sort of bleeding nature of a transition was incidental. It wasn't on purpose. It's, it was just sort of the impulse of like being in love with somebody and just wanting to kind of remember that incredible um, image and that incredible moment. And I think that I resisted that for so long as an art maker because I you know, got this really rigorous kind of theoretical training in CalArts especially, where they kind of um, teach you that you can't be a photographer, basically. Like, you can't, like, have that kind of spontaneous pleasure of making an image or, you know, um, and it felt, I had to disabuse myself of that. So I did it quietly. I disabused myself quietly for five years. Um, and in doing so, I kind of found my way back to the pleasure of image making. And I think that it couldn't have happened if I knew that it was going to be on display. Um, I, when Reese, I didn't even mention this, but he's a trans guy. So, like, there was also this element of us meeting each other and feeling like there was no precedent for that, or that we had never seen a representation of two trans people in a relationship. Um, we find ourselves wondering, like, how often has this happened? When has it happened? And of course it ha I mean, of course yeah, it yeah. has, but it's like without those representations, I mean, I think that that's what's underneath a high suicide rate. It's sort of like, if you never see yourself reflected in culture, you are looking into a void. Um, so, you know, without, how can we exist without representation? And there was an imperative there, you know, in, in my relationship with Reese where we thought, um, you know, we, we do exist and this is love and it's real and it doesn't look like anything that we've ever seen before. After five years of kind of accruing that material, I think we felt a certain amount of responsibility, you know? And I do, I feel a lot of responsibility too, you know, especially a younger generation um, you know, I have this kind of altruistic belief that like we can make the world better, that we can make the world that we would like to live on. Um, so there was, I mean, there's kind of this like, uh, accidental social justice common denominator in a lot of the things that I do. Yeah. 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 Um, so this is a question for both of you. I um, volunteer part-time on a suicide hotline, and I, we do get a lot of calls from mainly uh, young adults under 25, because sometimes I'm on until the 4 a.m. shift, and I was getting a lot of calls from individuals, young people who are transitioning, and lots of stories about um, drug use and depression, and really lonely and dark time for a lot of people, and it made me I mean, I used to go home and feel depressed and really angry, but that's the reason like, I'm doing a project now called Transparency with Gender Identity. So my question is to both of you. In terms of representation, how do you, do you have any advice for anyone who is doing an art project, who has a social agenda, but also really wants to honor their subject and give them the power of representing themselves and being more of a vehicle um, I, I don't have any kind of brilliant advice. I think you 
um, need to um, to meet the people and and talk, and collaborate, discuss where they are and what you can do, and and uh, perhaps the issue of them wanting to give back. Just what what Zachary was saying. Uh, giving back and maybe helping other people. I think when people get involved in wanting to help others that are coming along, they um, become much more self-confident and believe in themselves and see themselves as an active, in, 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 as an active person who can help rather than a victim who can't manage. So I guess that would be it. And, and um, when somebody is talking on the suicide hotline, um, I think you can turn the conversation a little bit away from, oh, poor me, poor me, poor me, I'm going to, you know, nothing is ever going to work for me, to, um, well, you know, how could you, you know, you have these gifts or these talents and, how do you think you could uh, use them, or something like that, rather than sort of um, adding, just being sympathetic, maybe. I'll say, oh, you poor dear. I said, you have a story to tell. You have a story to tell. Yes, exactly. And, and, you know, you're not the only one calling tonight. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, you're a dime a dozen. Everybody else is suffering. So let, what can we do to fix this, you know? Or you could even say, uh, how would you suggest that I, that I work with all these other people who are calling tonight? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think we all have a place in the conversation. I think that, you know, we all have a unique perspective. Um, I think that sharing and collaboration is oftentimes uh, neglected when it comes to photography and the relationship between author and subject. And there's such this kind of uh, horrific history in photography of colonization and ethnographic yeah. photography and you know people literally being you know colonized through the device of the camera um, so it's tricky and I think yeah. people are suspicious of that um, I think that it's imperative that we kind of you know, whether we're trans or not, kind of relate to each other as humans. And that's what's underneath, kind of, you know, yeah. any kind of conversation about gender equality or, you know, equality between people. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that there's a lot to learn. But there is this kind of parsing out of like, you know, well, who has the right to tell the story? And who has, you know, and what, you know, well, you're trying, you say you're trans, but you're not on hormones. And I, you know, I am, and I'm, you know, you know there's always like yes. levels of like, you know, yeah. allowance of like, I'm, a, you know, and yeah. I think that, you know, when you start kind of like drawing those lines or parsing things out in that way, it's really dangerous, right? Because like, the goal should be to expand your community and your base of support as much as possible and to not alienate other people. And I think that um, the trans community sometimes, you know, actually makes that mistake yeah. of alienating al allies. And I think, you know, that said, allies, um, well, I think Googling just like how to be a trans ally, how to be an ally to a trans person. Um, which is about like what you're saying, kind of uh, um, listening more than talking, you know, or like. As a teacher, I think getting to that area is very ambiguous in terms of what authorship is and collaboration. And I would just think really clearly and make it really clear to define the roles and boundaries. So. You know, people could be given the option of creating their own or provided with cameras for the vehicle. Or they could be given the possibility of being a 
portrait subject and understand, you know, the classical role. It's it's a collaboration, but the person that depicts that or capture that is considered the author. If you're going to change the terms, how are you going to change them? So they don't need to change in the middle of the process or down the road when something becomes yeah. interesting to somebody, you know. But just to keep keep that clear, because if somebody yeah. who's vulnerable comes into a project and yeah. they misunderstand that, and they misunderstand the ownership terms and stuff, then that's really uh, kind of a horrible thing to deal with later, you know. Make it a tool of empowerment. That's what I remember talking about in your cloud. So that's the air. Maybe it was Jim. Yeah, we were, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah. we were talking about, you know, like, I mean, for a lot of people to be in front of the camera is very empowering, and they get to, they're given a platform through which to speak. But it's the person capturing that that controls that. Yeah. You know? And it's not generally considered a collaboration. But if you do want to do a genuine collaboration, then figure out those terms from the outset. What does that mean, that partnership, how are decisions being made, and control, you know, in the distribution part? Because they're two different. I, re I remember, you know, a famous portrait subject of New York photographers of the 80s and 90s, John Hayes, who's a friend of mine who lives in Berlin, was always talking about his collaborations with Peter Hujar. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they're collaborations in that sense that he's amused to the photographer, but the photographer controls that body of work in his estate, yeah. makes money from it, releases it, and, you know, John was saying, but, you know, I give myself, and blah, 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 and what is my role, and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. And then he went and did a retreat in a convent and took a camera and photographed the nuns. Mm. And was telling me, this is like a couple years after we had this controversial discussion about what collaboration is in portraiture. And he told me that he had sold those portraits to the nuns, you know, who were interested in same pictures of this. And I was like, so John, wasn't it a collaboration? And why do they have to buy them if it was a collaboration? And you know, it's like, I mean, that's, it's a pretty explicit thing when it comes down to who owns it. So if you're going to do something other than that, be really clear about what those collaborative terms are. Um, well, if there are not any, any last question, yes. I just want to you elaborate on your, your role in the writer's room and on set and the cast and crew and how, like, it kind of it's, some of the nuances of your consultation with this group of people and in this great show. And, you know, like, yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, you know, it would be hard for me to sum it up. Of course. Um, I think you all would get bored. Um, <laughs> Actually, you know, recently we're given a lot of oversight, um, and from the inception of the project, when Jill started writing the pilot, we, you know, met with her, um, and we're on through, you know, the pilot, which was shot nine months before the series was, um, everything from, you know, hiring as many trans people as we could. We tried to hire one trans person in every department, because we wanted it to be an inclusive atmosphere where nobody was being othered, and there was nobody in that. I mean, in in Hollywood, like on a, you know, when you have a hundred people on set and it's these union guys who are just like total misogynists and like totally homo, like it was really kind of a uh, learning experience for a lot of people. We did you know trans sensitive uh, trans one on one trainings with all those people um, who worked really directly with the writers. I did a ton. Uh, research, really, and like just putting things in front of the writers. Um, so I worked uh, at the One Archive, which is the largest LGBT archive in America in, at USC. Um, I worked really closely with uh, Jeffrey Tambor, um, and as well as the other actors who did 
cast, there's like a hundred trans background actors, which is also like, even in scenes that you would never, I mean, scenes that like, you wouldn't, yeah, we cast trans people in roles that weren't written as trans, um, without kind of centering their kind of story around a trans subplot. Um, yeah, uh, every step of the way, I mean, the entire, uh, PR rollout, um, a lot of, <laughs> some unhappy person that wasn't yeah. cast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, even, like, you know, uh, advising on the writing of the episode summaries, you know, that you read when you, like, take on the episode, like, you kept on misgendering the main character, you have to be like, I don't know, this behind the scenes interviews, we'd be like, sit with the actors and be like, if you, like, you cannot, like, we'd have to help them, like, say lines over if you misgender the character. So, like, I mean, we were, like, really, kind of, um, really hands-on and really careful about making sure that, kind of, um, that everybody, kind of, was sensitive to the, the story and the character itself, and that it wasn't going to be, kind of, um, misrepresented. Nice. Yeah. And it was, I mean, you know, the people kind of that were involved in the project were unusually advanced, you know, just when it came to kind of their sensitivity around. So it was, you know, it was cool. Pretty much everything, you know. So. Thank you, Zephyr and Marriott. This is really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free to come and speak with them individually. We'll stay up. Yeah. Oh, we should mention I have uh, Chris Cuba books for sale, and if anybody wants to buy them, you can get Alan, who wrote the introduction, to sign them. Ha, ha, ha.